ladies and gentlemen, um, welcome to the meeting. Uh, my name is Roger Johnson. I'm standing in for David Morris, our chairman, uh, who's not able to be with us this afternoon. Um, it's uh, one announcement and then uh, a, a historic moment. Really. Um, but can I start by uh, <coughs> offering our congratulations to Chris Burton, who's sitting at the back. And just uh, Chris has recently become an honorary fellow of the BCS, uh, which reflects uh, his lifetime contribution to the work of the society and to the history of computing in particular. Chris, we're absolutely delighted uh, that you've been made an honorary fellow, and uh, I'm sure we'd all like to give you a round of applause. So, I, can I say thank you very much, and it was as much a surprise to me. Do you, do you want to say a word? Yeah, Chris? well, no more. <laughs> <laughs> thank you very much. It's, it's great to be recognised by your peers, um, and um, uh, I was delighted to get this little certificate through the post, and now that stands on uh, a shelf in my office. So I can't avoid looking at it. <laughs> As I said on my Christmas present to my wife, uh, this is from the old fellow. <laughs> Chris, thank you for those few words. And um, uh, 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 you've done so much uh, for the CCS as well as uh, in, up in Manchester in the museum and so on. Uh, we are indeed immensely grateful for uh, everything you've done so far and we look forward hopefully to many more years uh, of your work. So thank you very much indeed, Chris. Um, we come now to this, to this afternoon's lecture, uh, which uh, after um, my comments about Chris and Manchester, it's fitting that this one also relates to uh, Manchester and it's a real thrill and a delight to welcome Olev Chedzoy uh, to come and talk to us. Uh, the title of his talk is really self-explanatory. Uh, his first days as a programmer for the Manchester Mark I. And uh, you, you'll realise, since you're all interested in history, um, quite how far back in terms of our industry uh, the stories that uh, Olaf is going to tell us how far back that takes us. Um, and it is a real delight, Olaf, to welcome you here. We're grateful to you for coming up from Somerset uh, and uh, being with us today. So, Olaf, can I invite you to uh, give your talk on those early days as a programmer? Thank you. Thank you very much. And good afternoon to everybody. I would like to explain my approach to my talk today. Um, I'm really concerned with the impact it had on me rather than the details. Um, because in those days, computers were not very well known. Um, I'm referring now to October the 21st in 1952. It's relevant the way I got into computers. I wasn't a starry-eyed young man one who did get the latest BMW. I, I, I was demoed from National Service and um, I been married in the August, and uh, my wife had got a job in South East Lancashire, and I said I would get a job where it, where it was convenient, and I had no idea what it was going to be. Um, so uh, I contacted Franti in Holland which is on the borders of Manchester and Oldham, and uh, asked them to um, if they, if they had any jobs going, and they said, "Yes, we have got two jobs 
which might suit you. One in the transformer division and one in the instrument division. But you'll have to go to the instrument division first because they're going out. So I went to the instrument division and um, I was interviewed by Vivian Bowden and John Bennett. Um, I hadn't done any mathematics for two years while well, I was in national service and I was very wary of being asked about mathematics. <coughs> but I wasn't asked about mathematics. I was only asked about solving problems. And I can't remember what they were, really. <laughs> <laughs> and at the end of this half an hour interview, they offered me a job of a computer programmer. I had no idea what a computer was. <laughs> <laughs> and I had to apply for a computer program. <laughs> That's the way you get to life. <coughs> um, so I, that was on um, October the 17th, and I was off with that. And so I started on October the 21st which is Traf Trafalgar Day, and I'll always remember Trafalgar Day for a reason. What is important, though, to think of what the state of computing machinery was then. It was, there were calculating machines available. I'd heard of comptometers, um, and I knew little about them, and I couldn't look up Wikipedia <laughs> <laughs> so, um, um, I heard uh, something about punch cards and an electronic multiplying punch, but I've never seen one <coughs> and heard what it was. But fortunately, I discovered uh, later a facet calculator. And, most of the calculation was done in the country, in back rooms, <coughs> using things like a facet calculator or a Brunsvega. And Brunsvega was more common, but the facet, it, it was very heavy, about six kilos, and you couldn't carry it around. And it um, had an electronic version electrical version, not to the trunk. So, um, uh, that was the state of the art. I didn't know anything about any of the back rooms, really, what was then. But there was a, obviously a demand, particularly from industries like the aircraft industry, which wanted to know a lot more <coughs> calculations in the, there were apparently banks of uh, people using calculating machines. <coughs> that was the start. Uh, then I <coughs> arrived on the 21st of uh, October and I registered at the um, Personnel offices, and they called it personnel offices, and then there was talking about human resources. Um, and I was sent to the what we call the tin hut. <laughs> that was about two miles from Hollywood, the main factory. Um, uh, it, it was the time, this is 1952, for most of the aircraft industry which had been making planes had been running down and they were quite um, good at aluminium using, so they created buildings from aluminium and uh, this one was aluminium and glass mainly. And um, 
<clears throat> I was shown straight in to someone called Betty, Betty Dyke. <coughs> Somebody might have met her, but it's, it's possible. She was a lovely person, and she was going to teach me programming. She first said to me, do you know what a computer is? Well, I knew I'd say that. And um, I just said, it's a machinery, piece of machinery which you turn the handle on. <laughs> but um, that was only really the uh, introduction. She explained to me that uh, it was rather more than that, it was just obeying a set of instructions, but also the data, and uh, it contained them both within one concept. And she suggested that this, this concept was based on the store, so you could have instructions in the store and you could have um, numbers in the store. And I don't, I fortunately, I'd played around with binary numbers before, so that wasn't new for me. But she warned me that binary numbers, the binary representation wasn't just to represent numbers, it could represent letters and so on, which of course I vaguely knew, but I didn't think of it in the same way. Um, and she um, explained it a little bit more, and I realized this was the first introduction to, to information, processing information in the computer sense. <coughs> at, this, at this stage, we hadn't talked about information technology or processing anywhere in the world. That was not a unknown phrase. Uh, but the idea that binary representation of numbers and letters could be the same and interchanged was clear. But I had a block in understanding what the storage, how it was stored, because uh, I, I don't think anyone in the country, apart from those working with computers, about 25 <coughs> people, would know how information was stored. And these were category tubes, um, and I was told these were stored information and uh, and um, <coughs> sorry I lost my thread uh, I had I had explained the idea of how information was stored on a cathodic tube. You may have heard this but I think this explanation has got lost in history. If you think in terms of a mill pond, and you lob a stone into the middle of a mill pond, and you know a minute later, if the ripples are still there, you lob another one in, then, you, then you've got a storage system. <coughs> and she explained that that was exactly what happened on the electro, uh, uh, the, the electrons of the cathode ray tube. Uh, as the gun, electron gun fired at the screen, it caused a splash of electrons. And if you looked at it again, if the splash hadn't subsided completely, you generated another one. So it worked. And the great thing about the cathode ray tube was that it could get a lot more spots on it than just one. So 
I know about bistable circuits because I've been in the RAF and we had some bistable circuits in there, you know, but these were valve driven circuits and not not very efficient. I mean, you needed a block like this to saw one digit, and that wasn't really practical. So being able to get a thousand digits on a, on a cathode ray screen was a terrific advance. So I wasn't shown a screen at this stage, but I was shown a picture of a screen. And it was, it was then that I realized uh, that oh, every one of these spots was a bit of information and because it was electronic, it was immediately accessible, immediately, you wouldn't say it was immediately now, you're <laughs> 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 talking about milliseconds. Um, so, um, so you can see there that they tend to be grouped into groups of five. We can't refer to the contents of one particular spot. That's a inefficient. So you, you refer to the group of five, the contents of the group of five. And I was learning this on, on the first morning, within one hour of sitting down with Bethany. So the idea was to look at it in groups of five. <coughs> and <coughs> teleprinter tape was used uh, quite conveniently, and there are five holes across a tape, so there's a group there of five, and that's the real tape, you can see it, and there is a reader in the machine, the machine would accept that, so <coughs> thinking about things in terms of five bits as a character is quite helpful. It, it is possible to learn the symbols and it is absolutely necessary on the Franti Mark I to learn those symbols and that's why you've got the sheet of paper with you. If you, if you look at the... Um, If you look at the left hand side um, of, of the diagram and read, read down, you'll see stroke, or it's probably a bit clearer on the right hand side, the first column. Stroke E at A colon S I U. We had to learn all the and you did learn them by use because it was much, much better to do, know them than to have to keep looking them up all the time. because the trolley came over from the, from the Boston 
from, from, from the from, from the factory, and you could hear it every day. And, um, that was the cause of breaking off for about 20 minutes. Um, but that morning, it was a Monday morning, there were only about five of us in this particular office. There were programmers at Mouston. Because the computer at Manchester University, which we used, uh, I'll just <coughs> divert for a minute. The, um, the computer at Manchester was uh, originally a lash up in, in the lab, but Franti had manufactured it and to produce it to manufacturing standards, and it became the first production model. Um, that is uh, crucial, I think, in any equipment. Once you start putting it in production, it becomes real. And um, the, um, there, were, there were just about five of us in the room because the Manchester University arrangement was that Franti had the use of the computer all day long. Um, on Mondays and in the evenings on the other days. And so um, about seven people were down at the university because you took time <coughs> at the university trying your program out and you might sit there for five, ten minutes trying to work out why it didn't work. <laughs> <laughs> It always, and then, then you moved over and somebody else moved in and um, <coughs> it was fascinating really to do this um, but um, some people would stay there all day because they lived in Manchester and they wanted to use it quite a bit during the day others, others went down in the afternoon and um, I was told that I was going there in the afternoon to see them, this computer. But this, this little thing, we never called it the computer. We always called it the machine. And I don't know why it was called the machine. You know, why we chose to do that. But, um, so, uh, uh, over coffee that morning, I thought I would clear up one thing. And this may interest you. Uh, I wanted to know how you spell computer with an E or an O. <laughs> <laughs> and do you know there was not a unanimous opinion? <laughs> I mean, that's how new the whole thing was. <laughs> but then we moved on to I move on to the um, next stage and I was going to be a programmer, and frankly, I had a cyclostyled program sheet. Remember, we couldn't copy. There were no copiers in those days. You had to do cyclostyle if you wanted a number produced. Um, and if you look at this, you'll see that on the left hand side it is stroke E at A colon S. <coughs> Those are the 
verse 32 and uh, the uh, combinations of holes and not holes. think in terms of how we addressed any particular part of the store. If you think back, you saw the uh, screen with a lot of dots on it. You could identify which row it was, and it, by two letters, there were 32 columns like this available. Um, and within those, each row was called. So if if I um, referred to um, F E <coughs> F, it would be there, and that would be E stroke E column. So in fact, it would be just two identifiers which would identify any position in the category store. That will be instructions or numbers, short numbers. But Betty then showed me uh, a completed program sheet, or say one, I wouldn't say completed, but um, with the instructions in and some numbers there, and the flow where it goes back onto the original. What happened is that you go down through here, and this one, stroke T, you might go back there. And <coughs> so that is the standard loop. And these are numbers here. That's 32 and minus 1 <coughs> and so on. So that could use these numbers. And she was, she was trying to be helpful to encourage me to think forward. Now, that is one half of the instruction manual that you've got. Um, that is the point. We were after coffee, about an hour after coffee, I suppose. And I was presented with this, what you've got in front of you, as the instruction manual. That was my <laughs> instruction manual. And it is all there. And it, it is actually a, quite a work of art. It was produced by the drawing office because I said, you know, they had to use what copying equipment they've got and use the drawing office's equipment. And uh, um, this is vital, but it, it, is a, it is virtually complete. If, if you know the idea behind it, um, there are various parts. I will come to that later on. But now we have to, I've showed you the instruction length on the previous one. We now have to think in terms of word length. Um, uh, word length is 20 bits. bits. Um, that was on the previous one. Uh, that is a standard word 
A number was always two words because uh, it's a 40-bit number and 40 bits is about 12 decimal digits in accuracy. So um, the um, all the arithmetic was done in in 40 bit lengths. Unfortunately, when you get to multiplication, if you multiply two inches together, you get double the length. So the product of a multiplication was 80 bits. And that's how long. So. <coughs> So we have all the arithmetic was done in an accumulator and all the contents of stores were passed into the, into, into the accu accumulator. But the accumulator was in two halves, the most significant and the least significant half. So if you multiply two integers together <coughs> um, and there were long integers, it would be in, in the most both halves and you had to cut off what you didn't want. So so we identified the parts of the computer then there is the store, S, and I called it here S because store is <coughs> referred to as S here. Uh, that's for numbers and instructions. We have the control register, C, which counts. It tells you what stage what instruction yeah, the computer was at. <coughs> <coughs> You've got the accumulator in two halves, the most significant half and the least significant half. I, I slight amused, I told my wife on, on, on that evening, and her reaction, she was not in a mathematician. position. Um, but she um, said they should say more significant part than less significant part. We can't please everyone, can you? We considered the tape reader. <coughs> which worked very well. And it would read 200 parameters <coughs> <coughs> They would read 200 rows of, of, of tape a second and stop on any word. That's quite a, uh, a, a very <coughs> nice piece of machinery. There was a printer and punch which you could print results out. I won't go into those at the moment. And also, and I don't think anyone can learn this these days, what we had to learn it was important with logical gates. Now you have to think that the computer was not as uh, a steady state, but it de dealt with our train of pulses fed from the least significant <coughs> first. Now, in each 
case, uh, these are all altered, and you have to look at the gates A and B could be naught or one, and an AND gate, C would only be one if A and B were first one. If the second one are not equivalent, if A and B were not the same, C would be one. Um, okay. uh, if, the, if they were the same, C would be nothing. <coughs> and the OR gate is the, is the typical dysfunction. Uh, A and B were both one. Uh, either were A or B or one, both one, you would get C one. <coughs> be aware of these. I don't think anyone would be aware of them these days. But what we were told is that all the arithmetical calculations could be carried out comprised of these gates. And um, so you've got binary storage, think, <coughs> thinking of bases, binary storage, and you've got three logical gates. Um, that's what is defining the computer. That's a concept for the design of the computer. And it's all that. Um, but without introduction, um, to think it o over, um, we decided to stop for lunch. <laughs> <laughs> but, but you have to remember that still true direction was still the case in those days, so we could eat in the factory or bring sandwiches. But we were still very much in the uh, austerity role. Um, after lunch, we worked on the first program, very simple program, within the store, Betty had said there are three locations had X pounds, Y shillings, and Z pence. And I had to write the store, the program, to calculate the total number of pence. You wouldn't believe it. There's two ways of doing that. <laughs> you, you can take the pounds and multiply it by 240, and then you can take the shillings and multiply it by 20, and add them all together with the pence. Or else you can take the pounds and multiply it by 20, and add in the shillings, and then multiply it by 12. But <coughs> it can make a difference, because we didn't have that much store. I mean, we've seen a thousand column, uh, uh, um, a thousand locations, uh, 32 by 32, um, and that doesn't go very far when you start putting numbers in. All right, for the short program like that, it doesn't matter. So we talked a bit about that, and then um, I was taken to where we caught, caught the bus to uh, Manchester University, and And I was introduced to the machine. It's 
silent, but for the air conditioning, you've got this steady hum of the air conditioning. That always worked well. And, um, you know, people would come in and out. There was a programmer's room beside the computer room, and the programmers used to come in and use the machine. But, we also had a lot of um, visitors, and Francie had visitors because they were trying to get a lot of people interested in computers. And they had a set of very simple programs, um, <coughs> like timing reaction, um, uh, making a bid at bridge um, and uh, um, playing the national anthem rather badly. <laughs> <laughs> but these served a, a point that we were trying to get across the message that computers can do anything virtually if you approach it in the right sense. I don't think it really worked, worked for the National Anthem, it was so awful. <laughs> um, write it and it would have to be punished on the tape and we would put it into the computer using Turing input mm -hmm. and uh, um, I do remember if you <coughs> punched a tape and you got a hole in the wrong position, you were able to, obviously you could always make an additional number, an additional hole. So these are equipments to make you an additional hole. It's made in the model shop. And, um, uh, and if you had a hole too many in tape, you would put coloured cello tape over it. <laughs> and it worked. And it would stay there 10 or 20 times, but you were advised to really um, put it right uh, with, with reproducing the tape as soon as possible. We sort of ran the program I'd written with Betty, and that was the introduction to using the computer. And she showed me how to use it one instruction at a time. And it's very noticeable that that button is very worn. <laughs> because it's quite difficult to sort of sort out why, why a program doesn't work. And you, uh, she then explained to me that the um, machine actually based in four beats. Now, I said the control register um, the control register, the first line of that is the number of the next instruction. And the first operation is to add one to that counter. Um, 
and uh, the computer selects the instruction um, <coughs> controlled by the B line, which you don't need to worry about at the moment. Um, Modifies the divided, uh, uh, divides modified instruction into two parts essentially. That's the address which is concerned and the operation. So you get uh, an address like um, FE, as I said, um, you know, identifies the contents of one location and if, it, if it's like something like T-stroke the operation it means put it in the computer um, in the accumulator so you do that and it's identified and then the computer obeys the instruction uh, a beat took <coughs> 240 <coughs> microseconds or so milliseconds. Uh, so an ordinary instruction um, takes 960 microseconds. Multiplication took longer because it five beats in twelve hundred microseconds. But we thought that was going fast. <laughs> <coughs> so, by this stage, what Betty achieved with me was to in enjoy programming. I thought it was quite fun. It's a bit no writing sometimes, but and so we then proceeded. She warned me then that some of the instructions, and if you look at your sheet now on the left hand side, you'll see a lot of um, uh, instructions, electronic instructions are concerned with L, putting things into the least significant or getting them out of the least significant. And she explained to me that's why a lot of the instructions have got variations. Um, and if you've got something in the accumulator in the most significant and least significant, um, Stokes will take the most significant out and put it in the store and soak. E will take the least significant out and they've got variations on TA um, that will take the most um, significant put it in the store and zero the accumulator at the same time and that's <coughs> one thing that you had to always remember but it wasn't necessarily zero. Um, so you it's okay. Um, you, uh, that's the least significant um, into the store and zero into the least significant. And the last one, so few, I don't think I ever use. But it's a very special. One. So if you <coughs> if you want to look at these a little bit more, um, it is they are explained and everything.
upward, it's you you must have a very clear definition of the program you're going to write. This is what <coughs> <coughs> Except in, this is the next problem, is that the number of pence from tape to tape changed to pound shillings. <coughs> <coughs> Sorry. Uh, time to change it to pound shillings and pence. <coughs> 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 Three and this tape starts with blank characters, <coughs> the number of pens. Um. <laughs> Deciding how you um, how you reduce it to pound shillings and pence. Whether you divide by two hundred and forty. Remember, the computer wouldn't divide. <laughs> so you had to program the division. Um, or you um, divide by 20 and get the number of shillings. And it's obviously, this is the point which Bender is making, that one method will save space in your program, the other will save time. So it is data dependent if you've got you know, 12,000 pence. Uh, it's probably better to subtract 240 because it takes less time. But you've always got this balance, and if for a short program like that, it doesn't matter, but you, it's practice for getting, getting it right. And then, I'm going to some time. I'm going to Programmers arguing with the engineer 
because that part of that program didn't work. <laughs> you probably have been through this. You know, we couldn't decide. But um, uh, the <coughs> Manchester University computer was within a mile of the Trafford Park. And those days, with British Thompson Houston, AEI, and big firms were very concerned with the art welding, the electric art welding. You could almost feel the, the voltage change. So they got around this by putting in um, a flywheel, using using the flywheel to generate, um, to dry it. Because, it, because the voltage would change one, once it did to 180, which is not very good for electronic equipment. So if it was driving the flywheel and the flywheel was generating uh, um, constant electricity, that was a lot better. But we had the sort of things that happened is that you're looking at the screen and you see bright dots coming in and we had a name for them clots I was then shown um, several Venn <coughs> diagrams, which is, that's not a very good slide. And that was a university um, program which I found. And I don't know what it did, but it, you don't have to write them on cyclist style for anti equipment. I suppose. Guarantee wanted a proper record with people paying. And I did then find a binary added. And that was that pleased me in the end. And about this same uh, sorry, uh, on, on the same I discovered then that the uh, logical gates could be reproduced by using a NAND gate. So one NAND gate and one operation, and you've got binary storage and one binary operator. And this is the digital age in my opinion. This is what, you know, the digital age is, is waved around as a sort of phrase, but I, I feel that's really what it's got its roots in. And the last one is, is that the group of us in Franti in the Tin Hut, it was, a, it was a wonderful two years. It really was. We understood each other and we did lots of things together. And um, uh, I organized the reunion in 1993. And the Guardian, because we all read the Manchester Guardian. <laughs> so, so the Guardian had some of them and they published them. That's the end of Tin Hut. Thank you.
Ola, thanks so much for coming along and telling us that uh, account of your first day at, uh, uh, in Manchester all those years ago. Uh, I'm sure Olaf will do his best to answer questions. With, uh... Where we go? I, I have a load of questions. I have to learn. That's an interesting because I've always been chairman of the Northwest Group in Manchester. I also um, demonstrate baby every week at uh, the museum of Manchester. What's that? The, the thing that uh, Chris well, put together 20 years ago. It's still running 20 years time. So a lot of what you say rings through to stuff I see uh, once a week. And we do have people coming in talking about Mark One. This is a bit of Mark One um, alongside baby as well. So a lot of what you say about things on screens. I see that every week still. And I'd love you to see it again if you haven't already. Um, one of the discussions that's going on at the moment, a little bit of controversy between the other volunteers who demonstrate this, you mentioned computer or computer. One of the questions is, did you call it programs with an M, just M and an M or something? <laughs> well, I know, we did have a discussion about programs, whether we spelled it the American way or the French way. And there was a lot of support for the French way but it, you know, more and more stuff came, papers came around with, with, with just an end at the end, and eventually the argument got washed away, I think. Now, you, you give up an argument, don't you know, the British way is with <laughs> <laughs> I, think, I think that was the, the, the general agreement the volunteers came with in the end. You know, there's, a, there's a bit of pushback occasion saying, let's spell it the continental way to ends, but. I have seen some suggestion that it was just a single every um, You mentioned that the other thing about computers, and you said it's called the machine and not computer. Yes. Um, again, one of the things we have that we show people when they come to see a baby is there's a picture of a room full of people, and they're nearly all ladies, as unfortunately they were in those days, sat at, sat at calculators, yeah. and the sign over the top of it says it's the computer division. Because all those people were computers, because they were the ones that did the computing. So I suspect that even in the days when you started, a computer was somebody who sat at a calculator in the day. So you know, this was a machine, this was not a computer. A computer was a human being, this is a machine. Does that sound interesting? When I say, you know, that was within the group, we, we always refer to it to each other, are you going on the machine? Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. do, yeah. Yeah. Just to involve in the EDS and original documentation, yeah. What we today would call the arithmetic unit is called the computer oh, on the drawing, so just the arithmetic part of the machine. And it's called the, the mill as well. Yeah. 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 That's yeah. 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 a lot of terminology yeah. takes yeah. back yeah. in those days. Yeah. 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 Well, yeah. I know you've got Jonathan Swinton to talk to you in a few less times, and, and, and I've read his book, and he's got to manage to talk. So, what he's commented uh, on your chart, the, the zero is, is, is slash. Yeah. Yeah. And he'll be here again in a month's time, I think. Mean, but uh, he did say that um, he, you have a lot of zeros and a lot of this, except slash, 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 slash. And he commented, that's, that's the rain in Manchester. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm just wondering, after the, you got through the Betty programmes, what uh, projects did they put you on? <laughs> on day two, was it? <laughs> Um, after you run the Betty programs, uh, you know, in your first day, what projects did they, real projects, did they put you on, you know, uh, after that? Well, um, I don't think I did anything particularly in the first, probably I'd been there two weeks before I was assigned the project, and that was <coughs> to work for, to, and this will give you an idea of the sort of thinking that was a malaise in, in management and government. Um, it was to do with the uh, British National Coal um, and Railways. And what had happened is that during the wartime, there was a, a shortage of uh, trucks because they didn't get repaired and so on. And it was necessary to be transfer, uh, to transport the coal from the <coughs> pit heads to the power stations. And 
this was done by rail. And <coughs> they didn't, didn't have really enough trucks. And they didn't, every truck has got a number, apparently, even if you can't read it. <laughs> and um, what they wanted to think was, was it, could there be a program which directed the Indians to go around and collect the empty trucks and take them to the pit heads. And I, I had a good go in sort of sorting out a scheme, but I could not find out any data at all. <laughs> you know, I couldn't, I couldn't work out whether it's realistic. So it, it was a problem. But it's a very ill-defined problem, and you can't do it very much with that. <coughs> so I believe you were you were taught by Betty Betty Dyke. Is that correct? Where, who taught her? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> She, she, she was a natural teacher. She was a brilliant teacher. I don't know where she did it. Because I joined in, in October 52, um, but the team was set up in the spring of 1951. I don't know how many were there then. That's fine. Thank you so much. Thank you. It's very possible she taught herself, because a lot of them had to do in the end. Yes. 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 Did you actually meet um, Alan Turing while you were there? Uh, I wonder if you met Alan Turing uh, while you were so we, at Friend. Did you meet up with Alan Turing? I did from? meet him once, but I didn't know who he was. Oh, right. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know who he no, but he was, uh, very much, he was a reader at, in the Mass Department. And he was a very shadowing figure of our readers really employed for research. And, um, yes, and he, 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 he wrote, 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 wrote the programming manual for Mark 1. Mm. He wrote the programming manual for Mark 1, Alan Turing? Yes. Yeah. Uh, what I see of it is not a good, it's not an easy read. <laughs> <laughs> but, but I was there, he tended to use night times. You know, and, uh, Obviously, the problem is getting on top of him at that stage. We knew his psychiatrist. He lived at the end of our road. Mm. We knew his psychiatrist. There was, a, there was actually a film about him, and uh, Dr. Greenbaum featured quite a lot because he, uh, he helped, basically, help Alan with, he helped Alan with his problems. And so, no, start again. Start again. Yeah. I think is it worth repeating? Yes, yes, yes. yes. Yeah. We knew, we knew Alan Turing's. We knew Alan Turing's psychiatrist. He lived at the end of our road, and uh, we were we were actually told by him that he looked after this crazy mathematician. <laughs> <laughs> I've been reading the very end of the old very end slide, and it comes to an interesting and intriguing. Uh, end because it drops off but it tells of Conway Berners-Lee uh, meeting his wife and it said Ferranti hired uh, intelligent girls very cheaply <laughs> <laughs> this gave them the cultural position because prior to <laughs> so, so, by the way Conway Berners-Lee died in February last year yes, yes. <laughs> Any final questions, or is that uh, yes? <laughs> More of a, 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 an answer than a question. 
and you were asking about how program was spelled in the early days. And every Manchester, every Ferranti manual up until at least the mid 60s spelled it with a double M E. So I think that has to be the accepted. That was Ferranti swimming against the tide. Ferranti was the tide. I think this may be uh, one of those rare days when you're allowed to uh, assert that and nobody will dare to disagree. <laughs> um, Olaf, can I thank you on behalf of everybody here for uh, a very interesting talk uh, and the trouble you've taken to prepare it. We really are very grateful to you indeed. Can I uh, 